Great. Thank you very much, Barry. And uh, thank you, Michael, for presenting all my data, so I'll take any questions at this time. Um, I have no disclosures. <laughs> So let me tell you what the real issue is. I'll show some of the real data, but I want to get your head straight in terms of how to interpret it. Here's the real issue. In that without localizing studies, our traditional bilateral exploration has a 95% rate, uh, success rate leading to the phrase uh, that we commonly use in endocrine surgery that really the only localizing study necessary is to locate an experienced parathyroid surgeon. And the development of localizing studies and rapid IOPTH has resulted in focal exploration and the goal is that of a high success rate, shorter operative times, fewer complications, and better cosmesis. But in terms of data, in terms of whether this goal has been achieved, uh, is not entirely there. Now let me run you through a theoretical situation. So what is the key to the success of a focal operation? What components do we have to have in place? Number one, um, as pointed out, we now have to know what the incidence is of multiple gland disease and I'll walk you through our data. Then we have to know how good are localizing studies in predicting single gland disease. These are imperfect studies. And next, we wanna know how good interoperative PTH measurements are in determining that all of the pathology has been removed. And lastly, how good is the long-term follow-up? And I would argue that the criteria for determining whether a parathyroidectomy is successful should be the same biochemical criteria for the diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism, i.e. you need paired calcium and PTH values that do not support the diagnosis of recurrent disease. And the other real question then is, what is an acceptable failure rate balanced by the proposed benefits? So let's look at the incidence of multiple gland disease. So we did a rest retrospective review at two centers, um, north and south of the Mason-Dixon line. There are 828 patients, all with primary hyperpara. They had all undergone bilateral neck explorations. And here's what we found. 71% of these patients had single adenomas. And interestingly, to the percentage point, Emory and the Cleveland Clinic had identical numbers. Um, people have talked about vitamin D possibly being responsible. We could not. Uh, agree with that. Double adenomas were 15% and hyperplasia uh, was about the same at 13%. What's interesting is if you look at the patients who have double adenomas, now we're going to get into a typical parathyroid talk where we're kind of talking numbers and statistics, in that there are six combinations of where those two glands could live. And it turns out that 49% of those patients have double upper adenomas, like in the case that was, was presented. Previously, we had assumed that each of these six combinations were random. What this means, to make a long story short, is that if you have a patient with double adenomas, your other gland is by far much more likely to be on the contralateral side, that the situation of having both abnormal glands on the same side uh, is, is, uh, is going to be only 20% of those patients. So the question is, how can we study this further? And what we embarked on was a, a, a prospective evaluation to analyze this. So the question is, what happens if we use localizing studies to select just those patients who only showed one enlarged gland? And then we performed a focal parathyroid exploration. We measured interoperative PTH, it dropped by more than 50%, the Miami criteria, and so that would normally tell us to stop the operation. But being pig-headed, we went ahead and looked at the other three glands anyway. So this is what we did. We took a total of about 1,400 patients, and it turns out that weeding out the ones who had hyperplasia, prior neck surgery, uh, conco needed concomitant thyroid surgery, we were left with a pool of over 900 patients who are kind of a pure population to continue to study. And that's what I'll talk about next. We uh, got uh, uh, Sestamibi uh, iodine subtraction scans on these patients with CT co-localization. Uh, we found that they do quite a nice job as opposed to not the traditional non-SPECT uh, type of imaging. And also did surgeon performed ultrasound on these patients as well, and we have quite a bit of experience. So all patients got both, stud both imaging studies, you know, as part of this prospective evaluation. 
Then we did our evaluation. So we went ahead and uh, made a relatively small neck incision, and we then found the index gland that was pointed at by the preoperative localizing studies, and I will call this a focal exploration. Then we did our intraoperative PTH values, and then went ahead and looked at the other glands, a bilateral or four gland exploration. And here's what we found. Um, again, I just want to point out that our definition of multiple gland disease is additional glands that were both physically enlarged as well as hypercellular uh, by final pathology. We did uh, standard uh, rapid intraoperative PTH. We drew our samples from a systemic vein, which is actually an anterior jugular vein, easy to access, not the internal jugulars that can have false step ups. And then we did our post excision uh, sample 10 minutes after the gland was removed, Miami criteria and use a uh, standard uh, large machine that actually our regular hospital PTHs are drawn on as well. It got out some of the variability of some of these in-room assays uh, that were not uh, perfected at that time. So let me show what the pathology showed after we're all said and done after with our bilateral neck exploration in these patients where the localizing studies just told me we had a single gland. So here's what happens. Very similar numbers to what I showed you before. Uh, about 70% had single adenomas, roughly 30% had multiple gland disease. Now, if we look at each of the localizing studies, we can, in essence, run a simulation. We can, in the first column, pretend that we just got a systemibi scan. The second column, we can just pretend that we got an ultrasound. But for sake of time, let's just look at the purest group of patients in whom we got both a systemibi and an ultrasound and they both agreed on the same location. So in that group of 588 patients, uh, a single adenoma was identified in 77% uh, of those patients. One would hope that these tests were so good that it would be up in the high 90s, but it's not. 1% uh, had their single gland on the opposite side, so there's obviously a false positive and a false negative on those localizing tests. And again, 22% uh, had multiple gland disease. So in essence, what we've done by getting these localizing tests is of these patients walking in the door, roughly 70% uh, had a uh, single adenoma. And then once we got done, we ended up with 78%, um, 77% uh, having a single adenoma. So the localizing studies only enrich the population by a certain extent. So let's run through this. It's going to be a little complicated, but I'll, I'll run it down. So this is how we do the operation. We start out with our 916 patients, and let's just look at this column to start with. Uh, the patients who had only a single gland by their Sestamibi scan, those that we found an abnormal gland at that location turned out to be 92% of those patients. The one gland was removed, and the PTH then dropped appropriately in 91% in of those. And so generally, we would stop at this point. If we went ahead and explored, it turns out that 20% of those patients, or 16% of the entire group, because you realize as we run through these filters, not all made it through. So 16% of the original group um, would have been failed operations. We picked up multiple gland disease you know, by, by catching some of these, but only 16% uh, would have failed, that is, we would have found additional abnormal pathology. It's interesting that ultrasound will give us almost identical numbers of a 17% failure rate. And in the purest group, where both our ultrasound and system maybe agree on a single gland, uh, we would have ended up with about a 16% uh, rate of failure. And failure is defined not by persistence of disease, but finding additional hypercellular and enlarged glands. If we look at this uh, how good PTH is, and I'm going I'm to run through this quickly and just kind of give you the bottom line, it turns out that in that best group where the ultrasound and SESTA maybe agree, 93% of the patients will have a drop. And so we end up uh, with 93 patients who have multiple gland disease, or if the PTH stays elevated in 7% of those, it turns out that not 100% have multiple gland disease. Only 62% have multiple gland disease. And when we go through this calculation, this is how we get this number, that only 22% of the patients with multiple gland disease were detected by a persistently elevated PTH. 
The rest of the patients, multiple gland disease was only detected by big-headed continued exploration. One would like to find a subgroup in which these localizing tests work better, but we couldn't. We, uh, dividing the calciums just over 11 or just over 12 did not enrich this population. Looking at PTH levels that were at least twofold enlarged did not help. Age made no role. Gender played no role. Uh, patients who had concomitant thyroid disease uh, that did not need operation, for example, Hashimoto's or small goiters, where you think it may have obscured the localizing tests, made no difference. The size of the index gland, interestingly, made no difference. Psychologically, if you pluck out a big gland, your brain says there's nothing else going on. But here's, here's what happens. This graph shows the size of the index gland that we took out versus the additional gland that we took out. And it turns out that 23% of the second gland that we found was actually physically larger than the index gland. So again, uh, even in patients with relatively large glands, be on the lookout for additional pathology. To sum up this study, multiple glands were found in 32% of this group of patients who had sporadic primary hyperparathyroidism. The localizing studies we thought had relatively limited efficacy in screening out those with multiple glands. They reduced it down to 22%, not down to zero. Interoperative PTH, coincidental number, only detected 22% of patients with multiple gland disease. And this really left 16% of patients who had additional abnormal pathology that was detected only by further exploration. Now, I'm going to show the same graph that Michael showed, but I'm going to give you a little history in terms of what went on. Uh, Dr. Norman, who built his career doing focal exploration, um, actually is very compulsive at following his patients. And over time, what he found was uh, a relatively low early recurrence rate but a drop over time in which his unilateral patients uh, got a 5% recurrence rate over time. He felt that this was higher than it should be and went back to doing bilateral explorations and found out that over time his uh, durability of that operation was sustained with only about a 1% recurrence rate over time. And this then comes to my question in terms of what are the risks of doing a bilateral exploration versus uh, the having a 5% recurrence rate. It's a value judgment. So the big question is, did I save these patients from undergoing another operation by removing these or abnormal glands? Or would I have done just as well leaving them behind because the PTH fell appropriately? So to conclude, I really wish that focal exploration turned out to be just as good be easier for me just to pluck out a single gland rather than squint through my loops looking for those tiny suppressed ones. However, I'm concerned that leaving behind abnormal glands would result in a higher rate of recurrent disease. And then the real question is, is the morbidity of a focal approach that's done through a same size incision, uh, an entirely blunt dissection, uh, any different than the uh, current techniques of doing our, our bilateral approaches? I thank you for your attention.